Okay, we have about a minute and then we'll get started. Well, that's where I learned that cashews grew on trees when I was there. I never thought about that before. <laughs> there are definitely some interesting seed pods. Yep. Okay, so I have three o'clock on the dot and we still have people joining, but I want to welcome you all to our Master Gardener talk today on herb gardening. My name is Cindy Sanders. I'm the UF IFAS Extension Director for Alachua County, and we do this series monthly um, put on by our Master Gardener volunteers. So I'm going to turn it over to Christy Welch, who is also one of our Master Gardener volunteers who puts this ser these series together and gets our speakers together. So Christy. Absolutely. Thank you, Cindy. Welcome, everybody. I am excited to present or to share with you this next installment in our series on herb gardening. Um, I would like to make just a couple of notes. I, I am the administrator in this particular case, and I would like to let you know you are welcome to put comments in the chat box. Uh, but if you have any questions, whether during the presentation or after, please put them in the Q&A section so that we can record those questions and the answers that are given back to you along with the overall recording so that it's available for everybody afterwards. Yes, we are recording and it will be available on our YouTube site once it's been processed. That usually doesn't take long. And uh, once we are done with the program, I will be posting in the chat box a survey for you to fill out. We would be grateful if you did so that uh, we can get a better sense of what needs are being met. Perhaps we've missed in an area and we can improve in future programs. So with all that administrative stuff out of the way, I would love to welcome to the table, Debbie Brunner, one of our master gardeners who has had extensive uh, practice and experience in working with herb gardening, uh, everything from collecting seeds, sowing them, all the way through growing, storing, and uh, harvesting and storing. Uh, she has some great tips for you today that I hope you will uh, enjoy taking that information in. And with that, Debbie, please, it is all yours. Welcome to the table. Hello, I'm, I'm Debbie Brunner. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for joining us today um, for Herb Gardening for All. If you are new to herb gardening, I do hope that after today's presentation, um, you will want to start an herb garden. And if you have been um, growing herbs, I do hope that you leave today with some helpful hints and possibly some new herbs that you would like to add to your garden. There are so many wonderful herbs it's very difficult to narrow down what to include in the short time that we have today. Um, so what I've included are some common, easy to grow herbs, um, some that we often get questions about, and a couple less common ones that um, are of interest that you might want to add to your gardens. Today, we will be talking about why we grow herbs, where we grow them, when, We'll talk a little bit about how each of the herbs discussed today are propagated, used, and we'll discuss the best way for harvesting and preserving them. And at the end, I'll go into a little more detail. I'll mention, you know, for some, you know, freezing and drying, but at the end, I'll give you some helpful hints of how we do this. Um, when we talk about the where, I just want to say that we are in North Central Florida, um, Zone 9, 9A. Um, so if you're tuning in from somewhere else, um, your uh, local extension office, I'm sure, is happy to help answer questions specific to your area. When we think of growing herbs, the first thing that comes to mind is the culinary purpose. And we think of flavor, right? The herbs add flavor to our food. Um, but there's nothing that beats a fresh herb. Um, for example, you have a glass of tea and you put fresh sprigs of mint from your garden, um, you're not going to get the same experience uh, with a dried mint from, from a jar. Um, or one of my favorites, a slice of tomato with mozzarella cheese, fresh basil leaves on top, 
sprinkled with balsamic vinegar, you're just not going to get the same experience with dried basil from, from a jar that you get at the, at the grocery store. Um, they're less expensive to grow than they are to purchase at the grocery store. And there's also the health value. Um, many of our herbs um, contain vitamins that we need in our daily diet. Um, and by using herbs, um, we have less need for um, salt and fat and sugar um, when, we're, when we're cooking. Um, my, myself personally, I have not purchased um, salad dressing for myself for many years. Um, little drizzle of, of olive oil and, and vinegar sometimes, but um, fresh herbs from the garden sprinkled in your salad adds so much flavor and saves you from the, the salt and the fat and, and the sugar. Other reasons though for growing herbs are their, or, or, excuse me, their ornamental value. Um, herbs, many of them are very, very beautiful in their color, their texture, and they also add scent um, to our gardens. Um, it's nothing better than to rub up against a bush of, of rosemary and that beautiful scent. Um, if you enjoy grasses, the lemongrass is a beautiful grass. It's a plant that can stand alone, can be an anchor plant in your garden. Um, rosemary is another one. They are Florida friendly, they're easy to grow, and they last a long, long time. Most of our herbs are pest disease and bear resistant. And I say most because we will talk about one today um, that does have a little issue with the disease from time to time. Another wonderful reason for growing herbs is the fact that they attract pollinators, butterflies, bees, and other beneficial um, pollinators. Some of our herbs, the parsley, the dill, and the fennel are the host plant for the black swallow butterfly. And when I say host plant, what that means, you'll see butterflies fluttering from flower to flower. But what happens is when they lay their eggs, they can only lay their eggs on certain plants that their caterpillar can eat. And for the small tail, that would be your parsley, your dill and fennel. And without those herbs, um, there's no place to lay their eggs and there's no place for them to grow um, and, and multiply. So they that's, that's very important. <laughs> In addition to, um, to this, you know, throughout history, um, herbs have been used in companion gardening. Um, there's still more research being done on this, and that could be a class on its own, but um, often herbs are used to attract um, the good, deter the bad, sometimes to enhance the flavor of certain vegetables. Um, they've been used for crafts, soaps, lotions, and for medic medicinal reasons throughout history. So when we talk about the where, where to grow our herbs, um, often the first thing people think of is a plot that's designated just for herbs. But herbs are also a lot of times grown in vegetable gardens as well. Um, they are great because you know pollinators love them. They blend in very nicely in our flower beds. Um, if you have a small area or if you want to um, control how much an herb spreads, some of the herbs we'll talk about today um, spread and you might want to control them and keep them confined. Um, so hanging baskets and garden pots and planters are good for that. And uh, we also can grow them, you know, in a sunny windowsill in our, in our kitchen. Um, when I talk about garden pots and planters, I do want to stress, which I'm going to, you're going to hear quite a bit today, and we were even talking about this before the presentation started, um, herbs need well-drained soil. Um, when you buy pots, there should be drain holes in the bottom. So make sure that you turn your pot over because I found recently um, there, there's markings for where the, the drain holes should be, but the problem is, is they're not popped out. So make sure your drain holes are popped out. Then usually your pots come with a saucer in the bottom. I always remove my saucer. I, I don't want water standing with my herbs because as I said, they like well, um, well drained soil. Um, there was a mention before the program started, someone was saying that with this, this season, all the extra rain we've had, um, some of her herbs are, are waterlogged. So I'm sure if she's having that issue, a lot of you are having that issue. And, and sadly to say, probably the only solution is to dig them up and put them in a pot where you can control their environment. 
So moving on, um, we will discuss each of the herbs um, today. When, when, we, when we discuss each herb today, we're gonna to talk about whether it is a, an annual, a perennial, or a biennial. Um, annuals produce their foliage, their flowers, their seeds, all in one growing season, and then they die. An example would be basil. Basil is a very easy plant to propagate from seed. Um, within that season, it grows, it dies, and it's done. It doesn't come back. Um, some are perennials. Um, for example, we talked about the lemongrass just a few minutes ago and the rosemary, which we'll talk more about later, but both of those are perennials. Um, they may be evergreen, like the rosemary, stay green all year long, or like the lemongrass, depending on how harsh the winter is, it may or may not die back, but a perennial will always come back in the spring. A biannual is a plant that requires two years to complete, complete its full growth. So what will happen in the first year, all the, all the energy goes to the plant itself. It is the second year when it produces its flower, its seed, um, or its fruit. Um, and an example of that would be our, our, our parsley. And I do, I do want to back up just a moment. I see a note that I missed. When we talk about the where, um, one other thing you want to think about, especially if you're going to be harvesting your herbs and using them for culinary purposes, you want to think about pesticides and chemicals. Um, rosemary is a beautiful standalone. Uh, the next neighborhood over, they have in the median, the, the whole median is, is rosemary, absolutely beautiful. You may not want to grow rosemary along your driveway where it can pick up exhaust. Um, many of us are trying to be very Florida friendly. We avoid chemicals. Let's say you have a neighbor who's not so Florida friendly. They use a lot of chemicals. You know, you won't want to plant your herbs or, along their fence line. So um, just keep that in, in mind about where. Next up, we are going to talk about how to best propagate each of the herbs. Um, planting by seed is one. Um, there is a, a wonderful webinar on our, our YouTube st uh, station um, on, on how, to, how to sow seeds, and I recommend um, you watch that. I've seen it in person, and I've also watched it twice, and I learn something new every time I, I see it. Um, they can be propagated by cuttings, some of them. Um, which is where we cut them at an angle, put them in a glass of water till they develop roots and then you can plant them in soil. Um, dividing, which we'll talk more about as we go through the presentation. Transplants, um, those are plants that you buy from your garden center. And layering, um, an example would be like our mint that spreads very quickly and easily. And a lot of times when it trails over, it touches the ground and it starts developing new roots and you can cut it on both sides and, and create a new plant. We'll also Debbie, about I am questions. so sorry to interrupt. Yes. Is there any way you can get a little bit closer to your microphone? Uh, yes. Just... Yes. I, you know, I let me check that because as I was as we started, I'm hearing an echo, and I'm wondering if it's properly plugged in. Let me check real quick. That's what I thought. It's plugged into another computer. One second. Uh, <laughs> Technical issues are always fun. Bear with us, folks. We're going to help you out there. That, is that better? That sounds much better. Thank you. Okay. It sounds better here, too. So I, I'm in the right place. I am so sorry, everybody, for no, that. That's quite we all right. try to make sure we cover everything before we start, and sometimes we forget something. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll talk about the requirements of each, and that will be um, how much sun or shade or you know a mixture how much water some herbs do need more water than others but again even those that need water still need well drained soil i don't want to be in standing water so our first herb for today that we're going to talk about is basil basil is a warm season annual so as i said it propagates very very easily from seed you can purchase it but it, it grows very easily from seed um something that i've heard once in a in a presentation i had never even thought about you know some people can buy the basil you know like at Publix but you know in Publix it's been inside an air conditioned um cool area and then you take it outside and put it directly in the heat you know if you if you buy transplants you want to you want to make sure that they're used to the climate that you're going to put them in okay um one of the varieties that we're most familiar 
with would be the sweet or the Genovese. And this is the one that we see um, used in pesto. Um, and it's used often in, in, in Italian cooking. Um, when you're harvesting this plant, you want to harvest the young leaves. And you want to pinch the plant, plant often because when you're pinching, um, what you're doing is you're promoting new growth and a fuller, healthier plant. Um, basil can be frozen and dried, and we're going to talk about some of the techniques at the end for doing this. Um, as I said, most herbs are pest resistant. Well, sadly to say, in the last few years, we have found an issue with um, our basil getting the downy mildew disease. Um, this is impossible to prevent. It, there are spores that will travel through um, the wind long distances. When you first look at your basil, it's going to look like it has like a nutrient def uh, def deficiency. Um, you'll see some yellowing on, on the leaves. But if you go out early in the morning and you turn over your leaf, you look at the underside, um, you'll see the spores and the gray fuzziness. Um, the young plants are the ones that are most susceptible to this disease. One of the ways um, to try to keep the healthiest basil you possibly can is you want to minimize leaf wetness. So with this, what this means is, is you don't want to take the hose and just spray and water um, the whole plant. You want to water at the base of the plant. Reducing humidity is near impossible in Florida, but unless you grow it inside. Um, they like lots of sunshine and they also like um, air movement. And when we talk about air movement, um, what we mean is having enough space between your plants so that the air can flow around and around and help keep the moisture from, from lingering on the leaves. Another thing to think about um, when you're thinking of any of your herbs or anything in your garden, the best defense is um, to constantly examine, walk through your garden. As soon as you see something that doesn't look right, um, get rid of it. You know, uh, get your clippers, clip it, dispose of it, put it in the trash. Um, when you're clipping on a, a plant that, that doesn't look healthy, um, take some alcohol and clean spray or, or, you know, pour some alcohol, rubbing alcohol on your clippers before you go to the next plant so as not to um, spread that disease to something else. And also, um, when you see a bad pest, you know, pick it off, get rid of it right away before it, it becomes a real problem. But also know your, your pests, know your insects. As I have told you that, you know, some of our herbs are host plants for caterpillars, and I show you some pictures later, but you want to make sure you know what the creature is um, so you're not getting rid of something that's really beneficial. All right, there are other varieties of basil. Um, there's purple leaf, and the purple leaf is used pretty much like the sweet basil, um, also a very pretty plant with, with you know, the purple foliage. Uh, there's red basil, which is a little more spicy. There's holy basil, which is related to the sweet, but it's a hotter, more um, clove-like flavor. This one loves the heat and it reseeds very, very easily. Um, so what happens is, you know, the plant produces its flower and then the flower goes to seeds, the seeds drop on the ground and you can have lots of little babies. So you just want to keep an eye on this one because it, it will spread quickly and it's used um, mostly in like salads and Thai stir fries. We have the Thai um, basil, which has more of a licorice flavor. Um, it has purple flowers that the bees love. And then we have the African blue. The pollinators love African blue. At any given time, I can look out my back window and there are pollinators all over this. And I'm talking butterflies and bees and just, just it's always, something's always on this plant. Um, it has more of a camphor flavor, not used so much for culinary purposes, but um, Great bedding plant, um, great for, for our pollinators, butterfly, butterfly or hummingbird um, gardens. Um, it does have a sterile flower though. And what this means, unlike the holy basil, this one will not drop seed and, and you can't propagate it that way. This one you have to take cuttings in order to, to propagate. And then we also have the lemon and, and the lime basils. 
The ones that I have starred are the ones that are the least susceptible to the downy mildew disease. And um, I, I have to say, you know, you're constantly learning when you're gardening. You know, you, you never know it all. You're always trying new things. I changed up the way I've been growing my basil this year and I've had better success um, with it and haven't had as much of the downy mildew this year as I had um, in the past year. Okay, and the next one up is chives and this is a perennial. Um, it propagates very easily from seed and plant division. There's the garlic chive, which I call my old faithful. I love this one. And then there's the common chive. The garlic chive, my plant, I purchased many, many, many years ago. I can't even tell you how old it is. And it has just continued to produce, to, to flower. It has the white flower that you see up at the top goes to seed. Um, I have divided it. I've given it away. I've added it into new places within the garden. This one is, is just a, a good old faithful. The common chive um, has the purple flower, where the garlic chive has like a flat, more grass-like, um, wider um, leaf. The common chive has a tiny round um, hollow both are great um, for garnishing baked potato soups and salads. Just chop them up and, and, and sprinkle them on and both freeze well. Next up we have cilantro or coriander. Um, this is a cool weather annual. It propagates um, well from seed um, but it's best to sow it directly to where you want it to grow. I've sown mine directly into pots um full sun or part shade um a lot of the herbs like full sun but when you're putting them in pots which i'll discuss on some of them i don't put them in full sun they're part shade part sun um just because being in pots they will dry out a little faster so um you know this you're you're always learning and, and playing you know with with your herbs and trying to find the right spot and that's the nice thing about growing in pots um you have that where you can kind of experiment and see where they best grow. The cilantro is the leaf part of the plant and the coriander is the seed part. And the cilantro is used in um, salsas and the coriander is in sweets um, like cakes, cookies, and, and jams. Um, pollinators like the pinkish white flower. Um, and if cilantro is something you love, um, you might want to sow some fresh every two to three weeks um, to keep it going throughout the season. Next up, we have the culantro. Culantro is a substitute for cilantro, whereas the cilantro grows in the cool weather, um, the culantro grows in the warm season. This is a biannual. Um, you can propagate it by seed, but it's, it's slow to sow. I purchased this one, but it, it could take up to three weeks. So don't, don't get discouraged. Sometimes some of them take longer to germinate than others. It has a stronger flavor than the cilantro. Um, it has a, a long, tough leaf, unlike the, the, the cilantro. And um, when you harvest this, harvest this one, you want to harvest the outer leaves. This one does like moisture, but well-drained soil. So you'll have to water it possibly more often but it still wants well-drained soil. It likes the shade and the shade is important because if you don't have it in the shade, too much sun can cause it to bolt. And that means it goes to seed too early. And um, often with some of our herbs, um, they, they say the flavor's not as, as well um, once it's gone to seed or, or even um, when it's blooming. So some of our, our plants, you might want more than one, one to leave alone for the pollinators and one, you know, to keep trimmed back and deadheaded, keep it from blooming um, for um, your full flavor. Um, this one likes the shade and it attracts ladybugs and green lacewings. And you want these because they eat the aphids and we don't want the aphids. So know your pest. <laughs> Um, this is used in salsas, rice, stews, and sauces. Because it has the tougher leaf um, and it, it doesn't necessarily hold its flavor well, um, people will um, chop it up very fine and freeze it with some olive oil or run it through the food processor and um, store it with, with olive oil, freeze it with olive oil. 
Next up, we have the Cuban oregano. The Cuban oregano is a warm season perennial. It propagates very, very easily. Um, I lost my last plant because I did not protect it from the frost last year. I do have a new one, but my last one, um, it, it, it just spreads and it layers. And as it sprawls out and it touches the ground and it creates more roots, um, just more plants, more plants, more plants. I was giving it away. Finally, I was just discarding it because I, I mean, I, nobody else wanted it. <laughs> there was so much of it. Um, I do keep mine in a pot um, and you do have to protect it from the frost. And it likes semi-shade. It's used in marinades and salsas, and I have chopped it up and mixed it in with my black beans and rice. Now, you do not want to confuse this with the Vicks plant. And a lot of times you'll read in articles and they will say, oh, Cuban oregano, also known as Vicks plant, which I read that in an article. And so anyways, I saw the Vicks plant one day and I picked it up and brought it home and I started looking at it and I'm thinking, Mm, it has more of a camphor smell. It's, this, does, this isn't Cuban oregano. And so I planted it someplace separate away from my Cuban oregano so as not to confuse the plants. And I checked with uh, Master Gardener, who is also a botanist. And he said, definitely, they are two separate different plants. So the point here, on all the slides, I have included the common name and I've included the botanical name. Botanical names are very important. Do I go around calling these plants all by their botanical name? No. Can I even pronounce them correctly? No, I don't even try. But it's important to know that when you are buying something, make sure you know what you are purchasing. It's good to check them and search them by their botan botanical name to make sure, you know, that you really have what you think you have. You do not want to consume the Vicks plant, okay? Um, so if in doubt, do not, do not consume a plant. Next up, we have dill. Dill is a cool season annual. Um, you propagate um, from seed. It, it grows easily from seed, but you want to sow it directly outdoors. Um, it does not transplant well, okay? It has yellow flowers. And um, the variety that, that tends to do well in our area is the long leaf mammoth. And this um, is, as I said before, the host to the black swallowtail butterfly. Um, it's often grown um, in with our vegetable gardens, grown during um, September through March. Um, it's good dry, um, frozen, or fresh, and used um, for pickling and also in fish dishes. Next up, we have the common fennel. And this is not to be confused with the Florence fennel. The Florence fennel is the one that has the bulb. Um, this is what they call a short-lived perennial. Short-lived means this plant will probably last about three to five years. Um, it can be propagated by seed, like sun, moisture. It does need watering, but well-drained. Um, it, it, it can look a little thirsty during the summer months, um, but it's a beautiful ornamental. Um, it has that feathery, bronzy look. It's, it's very pretty in the gardens. Yellow blooms from summer to fall. And as I mentioned before, it is the host plant um, to our black swallowtail butterfly. Um, it's best in the ground, okay, because it does have deep roots. And this one, you do not want to plant it near any dill or cilantro, because what can happen is it will cross-pollinate and it will um, reduce your seed um, production and your flavor. Um, you don't want it to get too dry, because it's another one that can bolt too early, which means it goes to seed too soon. And uh, it may not have blooms the first year. Um, it, the blooms may not show up until the plant is a little more mature. But as I said, this is a, is a nice ornamental. Um, it attracts bees and lacewings and butterflies as well. It's great in a butterfly garden or in a hummingbird um, garden. Um, the leaves do not retain their flavor. Um, so um, the leaves and the, the stems can be frozen. And then, of course, you can harvest the seeds. Um, it's great for seafood, soups, and salads. Next up, I have lavender. This is one we get quite a few questions about. 
lavender is a perennial, but often it's treated as an annual here in, in our area. And the reason being is because they, they fail to survive longer because of wet, poorly drained soil, high humidity and poor air circulation. Um, it is an ornamental, but sadly to say, we're not going to see those big, long, beautiful fields with all those beautiful purple flowers. Um, but you can grow lavender here. It propagates by cuttings. It likes sun, dry. It likes dry soil, and it likes good airflow. Um, the varieties that you will see most often in our area are the Mustad and the Godwin Creek. There is a new variety that has been created in probably the last three years, um, Phenomenal, um, which is supposed to tolerate our humidity and our, our conditions better. I have not seen this one locally um, on the market. I did look it up back in um, February online and it was going for um, like 20 to $25 a plant. And I looked it up just the other day and I saw them for like 10 to 15 online. Um, so this is one hopefully, um, as it's been around for a while, we'll, we'll see it more in our area. The one pictured here is mine, one of mine, um, which is a Godwin Creek, which is a year and a half old. And um, I continue to experiment and play with my lavenders. I've been able to keep most of them a couple years. Um, this one is in a pot that's probably, um, 24 inches tall. It is under the um, eaves of my covered patio. I have three different or, uh, lavender plants. All three of them are under the eaves. They're never in direct rain, never. And strange enough, they're right next to my rain barrel. So what happens is they get splatters from the rain barrel and that's all they get. Um, only twice this summer have I gone out and looked at them and go, ooh, I think they might need a little bit of water and I give them a little bit of water. But other than that, they like it very, very dry. Um, so it, it's worth a try. You know, we're, we're always trying, we're always learning. Um, it's best to prune it in the spring. Um, often people will grow them in, with rocks as the mulch or out with their roses. Um, they, the leaves hold their their scent beautifully um, when dried. Um, they're used in potpourris and, and sachets. Um, when I was working, a lot of times I would just go out early in the morning before heading out and grab a few pinches and put it in my pocket. Um, you know, they they're, it's known for its aromatherapy and, you know, take a good sniff of it and say, okay, now I'm ready for the next chore or the next task of the day. <laughs> um, the, Lavender is used in cooking, but I cook a lot and I like to cook, but I've never used lavender in cooking. And I would not use lavender in cooking unless you knew for sure what um, lavender you have and that it definitely is a lavender for culinary purposes. Lemongrass, we mentioned before, okay, warm season perennial, um, propagates by plant division. Um, Lemongrass can grow three to six feet tall and three to four feet wide. And I had a plant like that and it was way too big for the area that I had it in. Um, so I did eventually dig it up. I do grow mine now in a large pot just to contain it. Um, each spring, um, I will dump it out of the pot depending on how the weather's been that winter. It may be very brown. Um, what I'll do is I'll divide the, the plant, give parts of it away, um, save a few back to put back in the pot with some fresh soil, um, give it a, a good liquid fertilizer. Um, if it has been a harsh winter, I'll, I'll pull up the, the stalks and just give it a good cut and about six inches off um, from the from the base. Um, and I also do this with my um, or my um, chives. My chives are another one because they'll they'll get kind of brown looking over the winter and then I'll pull them up and cut them about three inches up from from the soil and um, in no time they're full and all green and beautiful again. But this is great for a border or accent uh, mass planting. You want to harvest the older stalks to promote new growth. Um, the leaf the, the stalks can be bruised, you know, um, 
kind of crushed a little bit in the center and simmered in water for tea. People have made tea with this. Um, they dry the leaves in the sun or in the, in the oven and then use the leaves like bay leaf in, in teas and, and cooking and soups and stuff. Um, the leaves can be frozen for up to six months. They have high in vitamin A. Um, and this plant, um, the oils from this plant are non-toxic and have been used um, for uh, insect repellent, cosmetics, cleaning agents, soap, perfumes, papuri, um, a beautiful plant and uh, very Florida friendly and tolerates um, our climate wonderfully. Next is the Mexican tarragon. This is a perennial. This is another one of those um, old faithfuls. I purchased my plant, I can't even tell you how long ago. Um, and it's back in an area of the yard that's kind of neglected. Um, and it just comes back every year. Can be sold um, from seed because it takes about two weeks to germinate um, or from transplant. I bought mine as a, a transplant. Drought, heat, and humidity tolerant. It may freeze back, but um, even like last winter, I had a beautiful little clump and then all these little strangly um, pieces and I just trimmed back all the straggly brown and had a beautiful plant at the base in the spring. Um, fall blooms, beautiful ornamental. Um, can grow up to about two to three um, feet tall. Um, and as I said, or no, I don't think I did mention, I, I was the, the fennel. Don't uh, confuse this with the, the French tarragon. The French tarragon does not do well here. Um, doesn't grow well in Florida. And this is used in, um, the flowers can be used in the salads and the leaves can be used in meat and egg dishes. Next up is mint. Mint is a perennial, best planted in, in the fall or the spring to let it get established. It can be propagated from seed, cuttings, or division. Um, as I mentioned, this one will sprawl out. It can take over. So I have all mine in pots and in, in rectangular um, pots. Um, some of the varieties are peppermint, spearmint, apple mint, orange mint, chocolate mint. Um, here I have a picture of my mojito mint and my um, Kentucky kernel mint. They like sun part shade and mine are in part shade part sun because they are in pots. Um, they like moisture, they do need moisture, um, but well drained, okay. Uh, as I said, they can be very hardy and they can take over. So you might want to um, grow them in pots. And what I do um, every spring is I dump them and, you know, separate as needed, divide if needed, trim them up, give them a good trimming, top them off with some fresh soil and um, a liquid fertilizer and, and they're good to go. Um, they're used in um, desserts, beverages, meat, salads, jellies, and sauces. Um, depending on the variety, there are 19 species and species and many crosses. Um, some will have a white, bluish, or violet flowers. Um, they do attract pollinators. Um, the leaves are very tender and high in moisture content, so you can dry them, but you want to make sure that it's in a dark, low humidity area when you dry them so that they don't turn black and, and moldy. And then, of course, they can be frozen as well. Catnip and catmint. This is another one. A lot of times you see articles. Catmint, also known as catnip. They're not the same. They're two different plants. Um, catnip does well here. Catmint doesn't. Catnip is the one that the cats like um, the most. It has white flowers, but it can be kind of a stringy plant. Um, the photograph here, I went out to take some pictures for this presentation. I did it in February. And I looked at my hanging pot where I, one of my hanging pots where I keep my cat mint and it just, catnip, sorry. And it just looked like a bunch of dead pieces. And when I got up to it, I looked down inside the pot and here was this nice healthy clump of new growth. Um, it, uh, the cat mint has the lavender, but like lavender flower, but like I said, it doesn't do well here. It, it's the catnip. And they are two different plants and both do attract um, bees and butterflies and the catnip holds its, its um, scent well. I keep this one going um, for my cats because they love it. <laughs> Next up is um, oregano, also known as, oh, and one more thing about the catnip 
it grows very, very easy from seed, very easy to propagate. Um, the oregano is known as our pizza herb. It is a perennial. You can propagate it from seed or cuttings or division. Um, mine I purchased some time ago um, as, a, as a transplant. I've read somewhere that sometimes when you plant it from seed, the flavor isn't as well, but I couldn't tell you that for sure because I haven't grown it from seed. Um, this is one um, in the spring, you know, dump it, divide it out. Um, it, it, the, the division does very, very well. You can create new, new plants with it that way very easily. Likes full sun. Mine is getting morning sun, not afternoon sun because it is, they, they are in pots. Um, they will get tiny purple flowers mid to late summer, and they're used in Italian cooking. Um, they do suggest every two to three years to do divide up this plant um, for a healthier plant and for uh, better flavor, and it can be frozen or dried. Next up is parsley. Parsley is a cool season biannual. It propagates from seed, but you might have to soak your seeds for about three, you soak your seeds overnight before you plant them, and then it could take about three weeks for them um, to germinate. This plant likes light shade, and there's two varieties, the flat leaf and the curly leaf. Down on the bottom is the flat leaf, and what I have the little arrows pointing to, the red lines pointing to, are eggs. Those are the eggs that our black swallowtail butterfly lay on our parsley. Above that is the curly parsley, and the curly parsley, that is a swallowtail, black swallowtail caterpillar. And I've also included a picture up at the top because many people haven't seen um, what the chrysalis looks like. And I think they're just adorable because when you look at them face on, it almost looks like they have a little black nose, two eyes, and little ears. They're, they're just adorable. And it's just really just so fascinating to, to watch the process of um, the caterpillar from, or, or the butterfly from, from egg um, to when it flies off from the chrysalis. It's, it's quite fascinating. Parsley is um, packed with A, C, K, several B vitamins, calcium. Bees and pollinators like this plant, like the blooms, um, and it can be dried or frozen or fresh as a, as a garnish. Next up is rosemary, which we've mentioned before, a beautiful evergreen plant. Um, can just be a standalone or an anchor plant. It's it's just a beautiful plant with a beautiful scent. Um, it can be propagated by seed, which I haven't had much success with, but um, from green, the green cuttings, not, not the brown woody part. Um, it has small flowers that form in the second or the third year. It does like six hours of full sun. I do have mine in a large pot in full sun, but out with my um, roses. And uh, I, I just don't do anything with it. it it's, it's happy. Um, drought tolerant, Florida friendly, beautiful ornamental. Um, it's good fresh or dry. Um, my favorite, favorite, I use this herb a lot. I love potatoes. I love to chop up my potatoes, toss them in a little bit of um, olive oil, sprinkle fresh rosemary on them and bake them. That to me is just delicious. <laughs> um, but meats, potatoes, and breads. Um, when I mentioned that it's an ornamental, um, you'll often see them shaped into um, topiaries. Um, but a, a wonderful Florida-friendly plant. Next up, we have sage. Um, sage is a warm season perennial. Um, it can be propagated from seed in fall or spring or from seed cuttings or a transplant. Um, it has spikes of purple flowers on the mature plant, and there's different varieties which make it also a, a beautiful ornamental with its um, common, but the purple leaf or the variegated leaf, very, very pretty. Loves the full sun. Mine's out with the rosemary. Does great. Um, Florida friendly, likes the heat, um, does well. Um, it can be used in poultry dishes and um, dressing. Um, it holds its flavor when drying but you want to dry it very slowly to avoid a muskiness. Next up is thyme. Thyme is another perennial, um, slow to germinate, but I purchased mine as a transplant and have had it 
for a long time. Um, also from cuttings and divide. And this is another one I dump out and, and just divide up and start new plants with this one. Um, like sun and is drought tolerant. Mine, um, again, morning sun, not, not late sun because it is in a pot. Um, can be very pretty with the, the creeping thyme or the variegated. And then there's also the lemon. Good in soups, salads, and dressings. And it dries and freezes well. The last one that I included today, this is another Old Faithful. This is a plant I've had for a long, long time. And it just um, keeps producing and producing and producing. And it is yarrow. It is a semi-evergreen perennial. Um, it propagates by seed and um, by division. And I have divided and given it away, um, uh, repotted some for the Master Gardener pot set, uh, plant cell, um, has a beautiful flower, um, full sun, drought tolerant. I just ignore it. I don't do anything with it. Um, I did this past year. Um, it comes in other colors. It comes in yellow, red, and pink. So from an heirloom seed, seed company, I did um, sow some um, of the other ones. And they're, they're growing well. But they haven't bloomed yet, but I'm sure as they mature, um, I'll, I'll get some blooms. Great ground cover and beautiful cut flower. Now, this is one I've never used for culinary purposes. Um, but I, it, you can use the leaves in a salad, but I did read somewhere, um, do not eat if pregnant. So again, you know, when you're looking at your herbs, know what you're, what you have and, um, don't consume unless you're really sure. Um, but this is one that I have always had just for its or ornamental value. I just think it's beautiful. All right, when we talk about harvesting leaves, you want to harvest them on a warm, dry day, preferably in the morning after the dew has evaporated. Um, you want to harvest before the flower, before the herb um, flowers, because it's said that, that the, the herbs have better flavor um, before they flower. I'm not, I, I don't know, I go out a lot of times and pick, so it's I haven't really seen a big difference in flavor, but um, you want to use clean scissors, clippers, and a knife, and you want to cut back no more than one third of the plant. Um, now they say no th more than one third of the plant, and, and I usually follow that rule except for like with my um, chives and my lemongrass, which in the spring I will just give them a good cutting back, especially if it's been a harsh winter. Um, when you're harvesting your flowers, if you're using them for garnishes or salads or ice cubes, you want them in full bloom. Um, if you're using them for crafts, before they fully open so they don't fall apart on you. If When you're harvesting the seeds, you want to harvest those just before they turn brown from green, um, just before the seeds open, and store in a dry, cool place. Um, what I do is I cut off the stalk, the seed stalk, and I put it in an upside down in a brown paper bag and take a clothespin and close it. And then the seeds will drop in the bag and you can shake it. And then, and then you know, as it dries, you could, you know, pull the rest of them off. But it's just an easy way to, um, to dry them. I mean, you can lay them out on screens and paper towels, but I found this just an easy way and less messy and easier to gather. Um, when you're drying your herbs, um, of course, um, throughout history, uh, people have hung them, um, take a bunch of them, hang them upside down to dry with good airflow. Um, you can also use screens, lay them out on screens, but you want air circulation around the plants so that they, they, they dry well um, to prevent mold and mildew. A dark room, you know, low humidity. Um, you could use a microwave only 30 seconds at a time because you do not want to overcook them. You can also do it in the oven. Um, people will do that at like 180 degrees or, or less. Um, and then once they're dry, you know, you want to put them in a cool, dark um, container, airtight, and make sure you label it and date them. Uh, people will also use dehydrators as well. Um, and then we talked a little bit about freezing. When you're freezing, um, for example, you can lay out the um, the herbs on a on a baking sheet in a single layer. Put the put the baking sheet in the freezer, 
once they're frozen, then you take them out and then put them in the baggie so that they're not all clumped and frozen together. And then you can pull out what you need as you need it and store them in airtight bags that are labeled and dated. Um, with the ice cubes, um, if you're doing them because you want the flowers and you want them pretty to put in a drink, you will fill the ice tray halfway, put the flower in it, freeze it, then add water to top it off and freeze it again. And then you can gather your ice cubes after they're, you know, they're frozen and put them in a baggie. Um, with the herbs, you can chop them up, um, put them in, um, in the ice cubes, uh, ice cube trays, and top them off with water or olive oil. And then once they're frozen, pop them out, put them in baggies, and, and label them. Um, when you're freezing them, you will want to chop them when you freeze them. But if you're drying them, you'll want to keep them um, whole. Don't, don't crush them up until at the time of use. Um, what you want to do is, is check out um, our family and um, consumer science agents classes that she has coming up, uh, our mathematics. And um, she will have more um, information on how to take these herbs that you have grown and harvested and preserved and use them in your cooking. So that's it for today. What I've done is I have included a number of resources for you. Um, also, when you are looking up anything, I strongly recommend um, that you type in the name of the herb or the plant, comma, IFAS, and you will be taken to some wonderful documents um, that are, um, that gear to our area um, that are very, very, very helpful. Um, also, don't ever hesitate to contact our Master Gardener Help Desk. If you are not in our area, please don't hesitate to contact your help desk. I know they'll be happy to help you um, with um, characteristics unique to your area. Also, um, like us on Facebook and um, be sure to sign up for our newsletter. Um, you can get emails about upcoming programs. And now we're ready for questions. I thank you for um, being with us today. That was wonderful, Debbie. Thank you so much for Thank taking you. the time to share with us. I appreciate it. Um, before I lose everybody, folks, I did post the survey in the chat session. Uh, I know folks are adding in plenty of thank yous, uh, so it's scrolling pretty quick, but please take a moment to fill out our survey for us. And in the meantime, I really did try to answer as many questions as I could behind the scenes, but there are still a few left and more coming in. So if you've got a minute, let's see yes. if we can get through a couple of them. And uh, if for any reason, folks, we're not able to get to all of these questions, we will make sure that they are addressed in the posting, in the recording posting afterwards. Uh, so with that said, uh, let me start at the beginning. Um, I'm going to call this one out specifically because Nancy Griffin, I need you to provide just a little bit more information if you're able. She asked, why is my rosemary dying? But didn't give us any information. So I'm gonna give her a chance to type that, maybe a little extra info in and see if we can't help her out there. In the meantime, let's go on to another. Uh, is bronze fennel the same as common fennel? Uh, I mean, aside from the, the different coloration, uh, yes, if I understand yes. correctly, they're both culinary, but are they yes. used differently? No, no. The bronze and, and the common are the same. So what you want um, uh -huh. to understand is the Florence is the different one. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. So the bronze but, just happens to have the bronze color instead of being green. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. And doesn't it have something about, um, it doesn't create a bulb. Uh, so it doesn't create a bulb. The Florence one does. Right. Okay. Okay. Does that and make a difference a, in the flavor? No, I don't think so. I mean, but you know, it depends on what you're going to do. Cause you know, when, with, with the leaves from the common flannel, flannel, it, it's, it gives great flavor. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, then some people enjoy the, the bulb because it's, you know, it's, it can be roasted. It can be, you know, it's eat, can be True. eaten in a different way too. And that's another thing that I, I don't know that I mentioned, but also in, in addition to knowing your pest, also, you know, look at your, I always look at the underside before I harvest and I always make sure, sure. that there are no, no um, little eggs. <laughs> 
for our, nice our butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> <It's your queen. laughs> yes. Good call. Good call. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to, I'm going to bounce around here a little bit. Um, which mint grows the most upright? The, the, I, I haven't experienced anything um, that beyond my, some of my standard spearmints and peppermints that will grow maybe, well, that's right. not going to help you any, uh, right. maybe six to eight inches up and then it starts drooping over exactly. as and it that's, gets longer. That's very common. And your mints will do that except for the um, African mint. And, and that one um, is more of an upright, rounded plant which oh, is pretty okay. in the gardens, but then Good that, that one is, is um, loved by the, um, the pollinators, but it's um, not one that's used so much for culinary reasons. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. And that one, that one, I mean, mine is, it's, it's at least 18, it's at least 18 inches tall. That, that's a decent height there. Um, all the other ones are all sprawl. Yeah, they, they, you know, after a certain point, they just kind of droop. They, I mean, they're healthy, but, you know, they get yes. so heavy that they start drooping and spreading and yes. well, doing what mint does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, good deal. Um, is cat mint a warm or a cool season plant? Um, it, it is a warm season. It doesn't need to be protected, but it's, um, yes, it's, I mean, I do... Mine, mine that made it through the winter that I didn't protect, um, it was in a, it hangs in a tree. So it's protected by the tree. And the oh, reason I do that is because of my cats, because I don't want my cats laying on top of it and destroying the plant. <laughs> As they do. <laughs> As they do. They love their cat mint. Their experience in that But my one. one cat has figured out, I have pictures of him hanging um, from the branch hind legs and front paws in the in the pot <laughs> so just so you know folks if you have feline friends around uh catnip is belongs to them that there, there's yes. just no getting around it <laughs> yes all right then um okay i'm sure as much herb growing as you've done you've probably experimented with putting some different herbs in the same container, maybe just to save space. You don't have a whole lot of space in an area. Have you found that any certain combination of herbs work better together than others? Okay. Um, I know that's kind of a fully loaded question. There. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I don't do that as often. Mine are all standalone, but you want sure. like ones like the Mediterranean, um, like with your, your sage and your rosemary will do very well together. Um, Makes sense. Of course, you know, the, the parsley dill, um, they're in the same family, but then of course you don't want to put the fennel because then you can affect your seeds. Mm -hmm. um, I am sorry. I, that is something to add um, to the program again, you know, okay, if no, I do it again talk. later, I have because I don't do enough of that. I, I have tried a couple of different things. I do try to find, uh, follow the general principle of what kind of watering and soil needs do they have? And if exactly. that matches, then I might have a better chance at getting them to grow together. I've had some success growing chives, basil, and uh, cilantro together. Yes. Um, and like you don't want to put your mint that will need a little more water with like your rosemary or your sage. Right, right. So the Mediterraneans yeah. tend to go together, you know, um, but... And with pots, you just need to be careful to um, mine are in pots and they're all outside because of my cats. Sure. No, so, understood. Um, understood. Yeah. Yep. Mine are outside because they're the one edible item that the deer don't eat. Uh, <laughs> that is good to know. I always <laughs> thought I wanted deer in my yard. I thought they're, oh, they're just so beautiful. And then I hear the other master gardeners. I'm like, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll, walk, I'll go see them somewhere else. Right. <laughs> 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 it, that's one of those fun challenges you, you, you get to play with in gardening. But uh, okay, so let's see here. What else do I have? Um, are there any herbs that you would not recommend growing uh, hydroponically? 
I, I know that there are several herbs and we've got some of our, our offices ex, uh, in other counties that are doing hydroponic work uh, with various herbs and vegetables. Um, I've never done it. The first thing that it, comes to mind is- But I would, yeah, I would think the ones that like moisture might have better yeah. luck maybe with like mint, maybe your parsleys. Um, I, I, I've never done it. I cannot speak to that, but I would Fair not enough. think that your, your sage or your rosemary or lemongrass right. would do very well. But right. you know, we are always, always learning. I, I have so much more to learn and I, I'm learning something new every day. It's, I'm no, by no way an expert. <laughs> <laughs> no not at all. <laughs> well, if I remember correctly, later in the later in the year, we have a program, uh, or we're working on putting together a program on hydroponics. So, uh, I believe that Master Gardener might be able to to help assist us. That, I would that's love a plug, to. By the way, uh, <laughs> no, but another thing though is is it many um, there are a number of herbs that you can um, um, grow as greens, like you do your lentils and your beans. You, there's some of the herbs yeah. that. You exactly. can do that. So, um, but I That's haven't tried thought. that yet. I do it, but I don't do it with my herbs. So there's always something new to try. There's always something always. new to learn. <laughs> always. And always. I want to know more about the hydroponics. I or I purchased the stuff to do the lettuce, and I've never got around to putting it together yet. So, yeah, it's it's Understood. always something to try. Agreed. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you have a general expiration date for any herbs that you've dried? Um, or do you usually, just use them too quickly? <laughs> I, I do. I do. Um, That's usually I, my I, issue. I don't do them long term. Um, my, my, my rosemary, I go out and I pick fresh at all times. I don't dry it. Um, sure. I have dried mint, um, but yet um, I, I still have it it fresh and ready to use. So um, that's where we're fortunate, where we live here. Um, no, that's true. You know, I only put growing season. Like I will so put away some cilantro, but I only, you know, I never put away enough that it's, you know, I use it with the, before the next growing season is what I do. So. Understood. Understood. Okay. And those are areas where like Martha, when she talks about the food and the cooking, you know, those would be, you know, where she could better address, you know, how long food can stay in the freezer and, you know, Good we're point. more the growing and she has more of the, the food and the, I, I'm sure she could um, answer questions like that for us. Good point. Uh, we definitely have to remember that as our, uh, Boy, I have just blanked out on the title. She, <laughs> you ever have one of those days? Yes, our um, family and another, consumer our science agent. Office agents who deals it written with down so I remember it. <laughs> with food and consumer goods. Um, yes. And she's definitely the expert in that area. She and is, she has her definitely. own. Martha Maddox. Well, Martha Maddox is going to give the talk. Yes. And, uh, and so yeah, know, I do, I do the growing. She does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's Martha. She just answered the question. As, I'm sorry. What's that Colin? Martha just in the Q Q and a Martha just answered the questions, the okay. question about storing. Okay. I apologize. I've got over 20 questions in here, so I haven't, I haven't made it all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just, well, you're doing so well. I was just browsing, but. Uh. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Martha is telling us herbs are only good for one to two years if stored properly. Thank you, Martha, by the way. Yes. And you. do not store around heat, which. Right. Does yeah. make sense. And, and I really should apply that more. My spice cabinet is close to the stove, which I know it's oh. not supposed to be, but I just have no other place to put it. Uh, so that's something that we definitely need to be cognizant of. Fortunately, I use mine too quickly. Okay, be that as it, as it may. Um, let's see here. What else is... Uh, okay... Okay. Sorry, I've got some comments oh, mixed in with questions here, so let me part. Okay, we did have a couple of questions regarding where to find seeds or where to purchase a watercress plant. Um, do you have, it? I, I did, didn't have a chance to read your resources. Did okay. you have anything in there that might be able to help us find starter plants or seeds? 
um, you want to, if you're buying a plant, you want to go to a reliable nursery. Sure. Um, um, as far as the seeds, which I was asked last time because I wasn't sure if we were allowed to, you know, name places, but um, I've been getting my seeds from an heirloom seed company, rareseeds.com. Okay. And um, because you, you, you know, those are seeds that have been around for a while. And, mm -hmm. um, but those, that's where another, I, I get another my... resource for seeds is the Baker Creek Allen seeds in uh, Missouri. And they have a, uh, eclectic collection of, of seeds, of alum seeds particularly, and they're a very good company to deal with. Baker Creek. All right, good to note. Um, Debbie, I did finally, I got an answer from Nancy regarding her rosemary. She says that it's in full sun and about a three month old plant in well drained soil. Um, that, that's still kind of ambiguous. Nancy, I, I'm not sure exactly if we can give you an answer without a proper diagnosis uh, and, and taking a look at the, the plant itself. There really could be any number of reasons. Um, sometimes what looks like it's a well-drained area isn't. I'm experiencing that problem myself this year, actually. Uh, I had a rosemary or it's barely alive at the moment when it's done well for the past few years, uh, simply because um, we're having more water issues this year than we did last year. Um, I have pulled others up out of the soil and put them in pots, and then all of a sudden they were too dry and I couldn't, you know, get the right balance going for it. Young plants are very tender. Uh, they, yes. it takes rose, rosemary is the type of plant that takes a little bit of time to get established and you have to have just the perfect conditions for it. Um, I can only speak from my personal experience, uh, in different climate zones and I have always had to start a rosemary in a pot initially, make sure I had it in the best condition for about a year or two before I was able to plant it out. And then I had to amend the soil tremendously to make sure that, that it had the right conditions to grow. Um, uh, and also when you're increased. talking, yeah, when you're talking about a young plant, you know, you know, you talk about these that are Florida friendly, that's once they're established. And so what happens with the young plant, it does tend to need a little bit more attention and a little more water until it gets established. And once its roots get established, then you can walk away and say, you're on your own, you know. Point. But the young ones do need to be watched. Christy, there was a question about it from Regina. Regina, uh, uh, I noticed my basil plant stop, starts to drop leaves after I snip the leaves off. Uh, I, 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 I don't uh -huh. know what the rinse it. Once I snip the leaves off, it's so my my take on that is make sure your your cutting instruments, as we've heard from Debbie, that they're clean and sterilized. And it's always good to be sure that you you cut the um, the herb right above the node, right above the the junction with the leaves below. But it, there's also a problem once you leave a, a, an open stem with with um, fungal infections, etc. Particularly at this late time of year with basil. And I always pinch mine. I've, I've never used the clippers on mine. I'm, I'm always pinching them. But I wonder if she oh. has enough water for them to be dropping leaves. I mean, hmm, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point as well. And, and, my only experience has been because uh, I use basil prolifically. I'm constantly clipping mine. Uh, every once in a while, if I clip the wrong spot, some of the older leaves may drop off just because of the initial shock of, you know, losing a bit of itself. Um, I haven't noticed anything drastic. It, maybe they were close to falling off already, you know, it, but if I noticed that the, the plant continues to thrive, usually after two days, I've got two little, you know, sprouts on either side where it's getting ready to take off again. And I don't worry about it. Uh, leaf drop is normal. Uh, you know, maybe you had a particularly hot day that day uh, yes. and the leaves were old to begin with. I, if you don't see any powdery mildew or sooty mold, if you're keeping 
the the leaves aried, you know, giving it plenty of air, I wouldn't worry about it too much. That's just part of a life cycle, plant life cycle. It's an interesting question, which I've, I've suffered from too, from Tara. I've tried growing thyme many times, and each time I've lost it. <laughs> you know, I've lost here. it in many ways. <laughs> Same here. Do you have any, any tips for growing it? Mine is uh, in a pot. In a pot. <laughs> now, I thought I would move it out and give it more sun one time. I was I was rearranging the yard. And um, let me tell you, um, in the pot, it was way too much sun. Mine is in part shade, part sun. It is not in full sun. And, you know, it's just so many things they say, full sun, full sun, full sun. Florida, Florida Florida's sun full is sun is different. harsh. <laughs> it's very harsh. And so really, when you talk about full, full sun, my lemongrass, my rosemary, my sage, my yarrow, um, my mints are not. Um, none of my parsley, um, none of those are, um, all of those are in part shade, part sun. And a lot of them get morning sun and then they don't get the harsh western sun, except the lavender. Now the lavender is under the, the eaves so that it doesn't get the rain and it gets full, full hot western sun. But that's, you know, that's a plant that likes dry. So it, it's hard and I, I hate to say that, but you know, it's, I mean, we have a one master gardener and he says him and his wife, he, they, we buy three of everything. We plant it in three different places and see where it's the happiest, <laughs> which I mean, you know, everybody can't afford to do that, but you know, it's, um, sometimes it's trial and error and there's things I have dug up and I have moved them. Yeah, we all learn from our experiences and things that you think, oh, that'll do that well there and, and then uh-oh, and then you plant it somewhere else and suddenly it takes off and it's really yes. good. Exactly. Um, so the same thing. Uh, with uh, I tried to grow rosemary in, in a place retrospectively that it wasn't. Now I've got one that's almost three feet tall and I'm thinking of pruning uh, and taking cuttings and putting in a similar spot. Yes. Still Question about amending the soil and soil. Uh, Deb, Deb, the, the soil for herbs, I mean, you may want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I know you have those in pots and you probably yes. use a potting mix for those. Yes, I do. What else? I do. Well, I use a potting mix and oh, I'm fortunate because my, I mean, I've lived here for 30 years. My yard, I have oak trees and I have good soil. But for mine that are in, in pots, I, I do use a, a potting soil. And as I said, in the spring, a lot of them I will dump out, clean them up, trim them up, um, top them off with fresh potting soil, give them a good liquid fertilizer, and then I leave them alone for the year. I don't I don't fertilize them again. Um, like my lemongrass, I, I will um, divide it, um, top it off with fresh soil, some osmocot, and, and then um, a good watering and then let it go. So um, they get a good fertilizing usually once a year. Sometimes some of the mints, it depends on which one. Um, my amp apple mint when I went out the other day was looking pretty sad and um, I trimmed it up and gave it some fresh soil and fertilized it. But um, sometimes, you know, later in the summer, you know, but um, always in the spring, I clean them up. Makes sense. Okay, uh, let's see if we can knock a couple more out here. I've been trying to filter through comments and questions. Um, got one question here. How long does it take lavender and sage plants to become mature plants so they flower? And I think the idea is they're looking for them to be more ornamental than culinary. So yes. in this area, what might we expect? The sage uh, the second or third year. Mm -hmm. um, the lavender, um, mine did bloom um, this summer, and like I said, it was it was a year old. It okay. wasn't a lot of blooms, but sure. it, it had a, a few. Um, but you know, lavender, you just want to keep it dry, good airflow. Um, I, I had a plant years ago that lasted for a long time and it was on the west side of the house, got the western sun. But even then, you know, you're not you're not going to see like like the field behind me, you're not yeah. going to see a field of lavender purple flowers here in, in, sure. in Florida, sadly to say. So. That's just our area. That's understandable. Yes. yes. I grew up mostly for for um the scent. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, I because love I, I, just to walk by it and rub up against it or, or, or take mm-hmm. a pinch of it and put it in your pocket and, you know, have that scent with you throughout the day. You know, that's understood. Agreed. Okay. Um, do you have any experience growing savory or lemon verbena? Any thoughts on those two plants? No, no. Fair enough. <laughs> Lots of other herbs, but no, not that one. No. All right, then. Uh, well, it, you know what? There are plenty of folks that have grown it, and I'm sure we'll have some input along the lines yes. there. Um, let's There's see. so many new things to try. There's it's just not always, a time. <laughs> always. No pun intended, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, are some herbs better in hanging containers than potted? That, do you think it really makes a difference? Or could it, it depends on you. Yeah, I think it depends on your space. I mean, um, you know, I mean, I've, I've grown herbs for a long, long time. I know back in the day when I lived in an apartment, I would hang them on the patio in hanging pots. Mm-hmm. Um, my catnip's always in hanging pots. Um, I can see very easily, you know, if you're going to, because when you're in pots, you know, you're talking about a different environment. Um, they can dry out faster. Um, but, you know, I could easily see time in hanging pots, lying out on the ground, but in, you know, um, mints, um, they can get a little straggly, straggly looking, you know, they're not going to be mm-hmm. necessarily big, full lush, but, um, yes, I mean, thyme, oregano, um, basil, any of those could be put in hanging pots and be very pretty. Agreed. I've grown mint in hanging pots before just for space limitations and trying to contain it to some yes. degree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it did quite nicely for me. I, I, you know, a bit of maintenance, bit of water maintenance, but I thought it was worth it for that one season. <laughs> uh, as a follow up to the, that with mint, Christy, what I tried, I read somewhere, is to cut the bottom off a um, two gallon plastic pot and uh, bury your mint in the, in the ground. Yes. And that worked well for me for two years. Uh-huh. But uh, the mint still found a way out after after that amount of time and needed to be um, dealt it's with the problem. <laughs> it's definitely I've heard that. I've never tried it, but okay. Huh? But two years is yeah. the limit, huh, uh, Colin? <laughs> sorry? Two years is the limit, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, that was what happened for me. I, I, that, I, with those spready things, or any plant that tends to put out stolons or rhizomes, if you contain them and leave the the lid of the pot about half an inch above the ground and cut the bottom off, you get good drainage and, and, and they're contained. But I think some t- they finally get a bit uh, frustrated and do their plant thing. <laughs> but it, it worked for, for what it's worth. They have a mind of their good own. Good to know. <laughs> <Good to know. laughs> Okay, well, I think we are going to wrap this up. Yes, there are a couple of questions left. We are not going to uh, we are we are not going to ignore those questions. We will address them, but most of them are technical at this point in time. Uh, and I think Debbie has more than taken care of us in addressing uh, uh, the topic that that she came in to to fill us in on. So, thank folks, you. thank you so very much. Uh, for joining us today. If you haven't filled out the survey yet, please do. And if you have any issues, you can always reach out to the Master Gardener's Help Desk and to refer back to us with any que- other questions you may still have. In the meantime, this will be processed. Uh, this presentation was recorded. It will be processed and presented back out to the attendees via an email uh, with a link that will send you to our YouTube site that will get you back to this presentation. Keep in mind that uh, her references uh, on an earlier slide will be available. All of the questions that were asked and answered will be available to you as well so that you can go back and refer to any information that was discussed today. So with all that said and done, thank you so much again. I'm gonna pass this back over to our fearless leader, uh, Ms. Cindy Sanders. And Debbie, again, thank you so much. Colin, thanks for the help thank too. You. I appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you Christy and Debbie. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to stop recording and I think we're good. All right. <laughs>